My name is Max Gagliardi, and this is the Talk Energy Podcast. If you're watching this video, take a second, hit the subscribe button on YouTube, or you can follow me on your favorite podcast app. And I look at the stats on YouTube and 90 plus percent of you are not subscribed. Uh, This is free content. We put it out every week. Help me out. Do me a favor. Hit that subscribe button. For those of you that are consistently engaging on Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube, whatever your favorite social media platform is, I appreciate you. I've teased it a couple times. We really are making merch. I put out a little sample of the merch on Twitter uh, last week. It was popular. I'm getting that done here in the next couple weeks. I'm going to hook some of you guys up. So for the ones that have subscribed and that do engage, uh, you mean a lot. This episode's guest is Andy De La Rosa. He's one of my favorite followers on Energy Twitter, also known as EFT. Andy works for Underdog Wireline Services, and he's known on Twitter for posting educational videos talking about what he does. He's also known for writing his favorite Twitter handles on the perf guns before he sends them down hole. It's pretty sweet. You should check it out. I'll put his Twitter handle in the description of the episode. This episode's filled with discussions around the subculture that is known as EFT. We talk about the wireline business and what it is Andy does for a living. And lastly, we discuss the opportunities and challenges of what it's like being on site and fracking wells in the Permian Basin. Hope you enjoy the show. Andy, welcome to Talk Energy. Thanks for coming on. What's going on, man? It's good to it's good to be here. Yeah, it's good to have you on. I'm going to I'm going to tell you that if I had to have like a Mount Rushmore of energy Twitter, I think you would be like one of the faces up there for me. Uh, you've got a great energy Twitter and uh, I love the content, so I'm excited to have you on. Man, that's a uh, it's pretty bad to say that. I think there's uh definitely a few guys way or actually several guys that are before me if that would ever ever happen. I just mean uh, for me personally, like I enjoy the content. Like I feel like uh so here's a couple of things when we talk about it, when we talk about EFT, I think we got a lot of things to talk about. You post good content and I want to talk about what you do professionally in the oil and gas industry because there's not enough uh, content, certainly out in the field and on the lease and uh, on the well site and doing what you do, uh, what you do or just in general, I don't think there's enough content out there. Uh, so we're going to get into that uh, later on, but I think the Twitter stuff is just fun to talk about. It's such a subculture in the energy industry that like I don't know that everybody knows about and uh and you get on there and it's it's interesting it's funny uh there's some drama which we can, t- we can talk a little bit about I don't know that I want to get in like the specifics of the drama but we can talk about the drama high level uh yeah. but I think that like uh I think that like you put out really good content and I feel like this connection because I feel like most people on I guess we, everybody calls it EFT. So for people that don't know, it's like energy fin twit, right? I mean, I don't know. Energy finance Twitter is kind of where it started. I think it's a lot more than finance. Obviously it's more just like energy Twitter, but there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of people on there and like most people are anonymous, right? You've got these anonymous names. Uh, you got the roll call hat on with Kenny and he does a great job. I have no idea who this person is. My wife's always like, who are these people? And I'm like, I don't know. I'm like, I follow them on Twitter and uh, interact with their stuff. And so I feel this connection because I feel like you're willing to put your face out there and your name out there uh, and create quality content. So I just want to hear like, how'd you get into this, into the subculture of the energy industry? And like, what made you decide to be like, I'm just going to do it with my, with my name and my face. Yeah, so I've had my Twitter for a while. It's actually my second account. Um, when I first got onto it, the the whole the whole uh, purpose of me having it was to keep up with the bunch of bands that I follow that I try to catch concerts for. Or I was real uh, real big into the whole MMA culture and everything, just watching the fights and everything. Yeah. So that's that's the first reason I had it. So I think probably one of the uh, true first EFT accounts that I follow is, is going to be Frack Slap. Which I, I personally know, and we used to work together here in Midland, Texas, at a wireline company together back in uh, 2013, 2014, in that timeline. So me and him uh, back then, we were operators together, and uh, we would we would do wireline jobs. Well, um, ended up finding him on Twitter, and uh, I knew he liked MMA a lot too. And obviously, he was the oil and gas, so I started following him. And uh, the earliest memories that I have of EFT was actually. Uh, when Poundgate started and whenever oil just took a dump on <laughs> yeah, uh, l- last yeah. year on, on 420. So I started, you know, I, I saw Colin say the whole infamous uh, oil goes down to $4.20. I'm going to smoke a pound on YouTube. I thought that was pretty <laughs> fucking funny. Um, so I started seeing all these people just start, like, I guess, uh, try to hold them liable to it, which I don't know how serious they are. I wouldn't think, I mean, I, I don't know. 
I don't I don't think it's uh, serious unless it'd be, maybe it would really be is, rough to people. smoke a pound, but I think that you can still give him a hard time about it. I think that's totally fair game. You can't be making these like uh, ultimatums, or I guess I don't know if that's yeah. the right word, but you can't be out there like th- make throwing out these uh, promises if uh, you're not oh, gonna yeah. follow through. <laughs> well, uh, so so that happened, and then I started like noticing a pattern of uh, the same people always commenting on a on a Collins page. And then I started noticing another pattern. It's like, hey man, these guys, uh, these aren't really them. These aren't their faces. Like, this, some of them are cartoon characters or whatever, or just <laughs> yeah, I don't know, ran, ran, random, random stuff, like, dude. My wife, she yeah. looks at it and she's like, who are these? She's like, what is this person? And I can call. I don't want to call it like individual accounts, but there's some random. There's some random stuff. Yeah. So actually, man, uh, a lot of these accounts, dude. Like the whole. Uh, I guess that's when I really started using the whole term anon because even when like anonymous started and all that crap, I didn't think about it. Like as I started hearing anon, I was like, okay, anon, whatever. And I was, some of these accounts like, man, these guys are, these guys are pretty damn funny. Yeah. And then yeah. I started like, uh, sometimes I would just post random, you know, uh, videos of me in the field and Colin would retweet them. But what I noticed is when Colin would retweet them, they'd get a lot of, uh, pops off a lot of likes. Yeah. yeah. They would just, I was like, damn, I was like, it's like, I'm surprised that, you know, oil and gas is kind of taken off when, you know, on these uh, likes or retweets or whatever. A couple other accounts started following me. Some of the earliest accounts that followed me were like uh, Landman Live, Permian Landman, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, Josh Polar, which he's he's not an Anon account, but those are some of the earliest ones I can remember. Josh puts his, fa- Josh puts his face on there. He's he's all about it. Yeah, yeah. He's a uh, he he uh, him me Andy Oilman uh, Alberta Garbage just recently started doing it. Hot dog oil, I believe he he he's posted a few videos. Um, he's he's got good he's got good stuff. stuff. He's got good stuff. I like the field. Yeah, stuff. I like the stuff out on the lease. Yeah, these guys are putting out content, and uh, man, uh, kind of getting sidetracked on everything. But, no, it's not a sidetrack. It's a podcast. That's what it's about. We get yeah, sidetracked. Yeah, just to talk. So, uh, I guess to like jump forward on everything. Uh, well, it, this was recent within the past, uh, like 90 days. Yeah. I, I was like, you know what? I'm going to, I'm just going to post a random ass video. Right. So I, I recorded a, a little video of our, uh, skid unit, which is like a little third party generator pack. I think it was like a minute video, dude. And that one started taking off. Like people started DMing me or they were just commenting on, you know, on the, the stuff that I post. Like, Hey man, you should start a YouTube, which, you know, I've, I don't think I'll ever do that to be honest with you. Um, I was like, man, these people are really liking it. So I put another video and then another one and just started taking off. Like, I think I checked my analytics <laughs> and for April or the, the first month I was at like, like 2.44 million like impressions and stuff. I was that's like, oh, insane. Shit, dude, that's that's yeah, insane. I was like, dude, this is wild. Well, so that's the thing is like, out. that's the thing. Oh, hold on. I didn't mean to cut you off, but that's the thing is like, if you put out content that people like, like it's really simple. And it's like, if you're putting out something that, uh, that people resonate with, then it like it's popular like i wasn't just like bsing you when i said that like i enjoy the i enjoy your feed like i follow a lot of people on eft energy twitter uh and i follow a lot of just other people too and the content is authentic and it's uh it's real it's you doing what you do and it's also kind of like educational in a way right like it's like you showing like what's going on uh, with your profession and like, honestly, man, I don't know anything about wireline and we're going to get into it here in a, a bit, how ignorant I am on it, but just, it's, it's cool. Like people, people want to see what's happening. And I think that what you're putting out there, I mean, clearly like that's an insane amount of impressions for somebody that, what did you say? Your follower count was like, not that high at the time, right? No, when it, when it took off, um, uh, when I, right before I posted my first video, I was just barely above 200, which is still really not high, but just to go from like 200 to like, I'm, you know, I'm like a little bit over 1300. I'm like, you know, dang, that's a lot to me. That's a lot. I mean, it's you got lot. these other guys. It's a lot. It's more yeah. than I got. Yeah. I just started my Twitter and like, it's, you know, I mean, that's a lot of people. If you really think about it, like, I know it's easy to get caught up in like the, uh, looking at people with like these humongous accounts with like whatever, yeah. hundreds of thousands or tens of thousands or whatever, but like 10 people is a lot of people in my opinion. There's a lot. I mean, like, I don't know. It's weird. Like that's the thing about content is like people will ask me and they'll be like, like how many views did you know that thing that you post got and i'm like i don't know like a hundred something i don't know i'll like throw out some number and they're like is that a lot and i'm like i don't to me it seems like a lot i'm like that's oh, more yeah. than like I, before i did anything on social media it was zero so uh i'm thinking what you're telling me sounds like a ton that says a lot 
yeah, it's it's crazy, dude, because I never had any intentions of any of this happening. I was just going to put one video, and like I said, everyone gave me really good feedback. I've pretty much had zero negative feedback on anything I've done, you know. There are things I try to take in consideration, like when I'm posting, you know, any type of uh, videos from the field, like always make sure to not mention, you know, who who I'm out there working for. Right. Uh, I try not to I try not to show any other personnel that right. I would fit, that I would think, you know, possibly put, you know, where I work at at risk or possibly, you know, my job at risk sure. or anything. And I, and I and I sit back and I think about it, and you know, like my boss has talked to me about it and stuff. I was like, well. It's like really what I'm doing is I'm explaining tools and I'm explaining tools on our side. You know, I'm not going up to like, you know, hey, this is a frack pump or going into the data van. This is Joe Schmo. He works for freaking big oil company number two or whatever. You know, I'm not not doing that. And um, that's all the things I always I try to take into consideration because like I'll have some people that will message me asking a lot of uh, individual questions. And sometimes I just won't even say anything or. I mean, I've gone as far as to block them, but now I tried to not block anybody. Like, there's been several people I've been unblocking and everything that's uh, been affiliated with the whole EFT drama bull crap. Yeah, I'm not a big block person. I try to just be like, I don't know. We'll get into that. I have like pretty strong views. I feel like it's kind of soft to block people. That's just my opinion. I don't know if it's a bot yeah. or if it's a scammer. You can block them. That's okay. <laughs> yeah, uh, no, I. Uh, I feel the same way as you, to be honest with you. At least now I do, because I had to sit back and think over the weekend. I was like, man, I said, just ignore all the bull crap ass. I'll just mute people. That's the best I can do is mute Mute's them. Mute's good. You know, Mute's can... good. Just like yeah. mute the word red bucket and just move on, man. Just move on. <laughs> I, I did oh, yeah, it. Sure. I did it early, early in that saga. But uh, I, think the, the, I think the only real words I want to mute is like COVID and stuff like that. Yeah. Like, hey, yeah. You know, that shit. I muted a lot of stuff. So like I got on, so my thing real quick, I don't want to, this is not about me, but I'll tell you my Twitter journey really quick is like, I had a Twitter since 2009. Uh, I had it on private just because I was like, I mainly was just following news sources and I had like yeah. a couple, I had like less than a hundred of my like close friends that followed. Uh, I will admit that I did have a troll account that it was a non that I kind of like got on <laughs> and would like post a little bit of hot takes for a minute uh and i can that was when i first like noticed eft it was kind of like probably 2018 19 is when i felt like it and i'd be curious to hear if somebody could like tell me the history i don't know if anybody really knows it sounds like to me from what i've gathered is about 18 19 is where it really became kind of prominent because i feel like before that there was really not an energy presence uh per, per se on twitter i don't know maybe someone else can correct me there but i noticed some of the parody accounts and some things happening back in kind of that time frame. And I went through this weird phase where I just got off social media. Like I, right before this phase where now I'm like on social media a lot, I went through a period where I just was like, I was just like a lot of negativity. I don't know. I think that the problem that I had was that I wasn't careful enough to curate my feed. Does that make sense? Like I hadn't like yeah, taken yeah. the time to just like really think about what I was letting enter into my scroll and so you go through a few, you know, years and years. I mean, I had it for like 10 years and I just like wasn't really being cautious about what I let into my feed. And I just wasn't, I was just on it all the time and it wasn't like a positive thing for me. And I just got to this point where I was like, you know what, the stuff that I'm reading on here, I just, I had to take a break. So I basically in like 2019, I went dark on all social media. Uh, and then I had like a weird thing in 2020 where I decided to start a podcast and that's a whole nother story. But, um, but EFT is something that is, it's a positive. It's a good. So I think it's a positive overall. It's a good subculture for the energy industry. I think that anybody that's watching this, uh, that's on, that's not on Twitter should just get one. I mean, I, at the end of the day, like, and I think I would encourage you to get people to get one and I would encourage them to get one and use their real name, which might be a hot take, uh, on EFT. Cause I feel like I've made that take before where I'm like, you know what, put yourself out there. People want to, uh, people want to get on there and have a lot of hot takes, but they don't want to tie their name to it. I'm kind of like, yeah, if you really want to get out there and hot take, you should probably, I don't know. I have more respect for guys like you and maybe that's self-serving because I'm out there uh, personally and I wasn't for years, but I would encourage people to get on, get your name on there. And if you want to interact, that's fine. If not, that's fine, but at least tune in. I mean, do you think it's worthwhile? I think it's, I think it's worthwhile to be part of the energy Twitter culture. Yeah. Um, EFT, uh, I know it's not just uh, oil and gas, but that's honestly the way that I like to look at it because when I came onto this, you know, into the whole community and everything, I'm just some just an oil, 
I'm just an oil hand. You know, I'm just a field hand. That's all I am. I work in the oil and gas industry. And I been I slowly started to learn that hey man, it's not just oil and gas. Like there's you know, you have your financial side to it, obviously. Sure, sure. You know, energy finance Twitter. And uh I think uh since I've been on it, you know, I really haven't even been on it that long. I was I guess more than anything, I was more of a lurker, but still wasn't an anon. I would just see it interact with a couple of people, but I never participate in things like roll call or anything or, right, you know, right. beforehand posting the videos or, you know, even just using the hashtag and all that stuff. But I think it's, an, I, I like it a lot, dude. I really do. I think it's badass for the most part. There's it's been a few times where I'm like, man, this is, it's getting kind of uh, dumb, but I think it's a really positive thing, dude. It's a, I mean, I get a lot of good feedback and everything. I've, I've made some, you know, some friendships already from it. There's a few people that have, you know, gotten the pleasure of meeting or linking up with, uh, Lindsay had this, um, I don't know if you're familiar with her account. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, she has. She's with uh, Energy Strong, and they did like a, a little get together over at a local bar here in Midland. And man, I met some. I met some good people. You know, some from the community, some outside of you know Twitter and all that. And I had a blast. It's it's really cool when you actually get to put, you know, the guys that the guys are the girls that want to show who they are. When you get to put a, a face with the with the account that is anon. It's some really good people out there that are on EFT. Yeah. Well, there's a community element to it that I think is positive. There is this uh, social media for good. I, you know, there's ways. I think that I per- personally had to got to a point where I was like very negative on social media, and there's still huge parts of it that I am kind of still negative on. But for the, but I've come around to the fact that it can be a positive, and it can be a community, and it's a way to meet people. And like I've had surprisingly on. Uh, I guess not that surprising on EFT. I've had people come out and be like very supportive and be, you know, I've had multiple people on here. I'm not going to call out names of accounts, but people have been like, this has been a huge positive for me. I've made a ton of networking. I've met a lot of people. I'm actually jealous of uh, the Midland. Like I saw the Midland, you guys got together and I see all the stuff in Houston <laughs> and I'm in Oklahoma city, which at one point we had the most rigs running uh, in Oklahoma city in terms of the companies running them. Uh, than anybody uh, there for a minute, uh, kind of in the heyday of the show revolution, it's dropped off a little bit, but I definitely get that feeling of jealousy around uh, Houston and Midland. There's a community there, but I think at least if you're part of energy Twitter, you can kind of connect with that audience and with those people. And just, I don't know. I think it's a positive thing. I think people should do, I think people should get involved, but there has been some drama lately. And I just think that, uh, I don't know, man, people, it's like getting, it's like when you're behind the wheel of a car and there's that windshield in front of you and you're somewhat anonymous. And a lot of these accounts are anonymous. You just kind of get that road rage. And I think people need to chill out a little bit. I mean, obviously there's some annoying stuff that happens out there. A lot of people with either hot takes or they want to be very opinionated. Social media tends to pull out the opinionated people. And I just tend to kind of, sometimes I get sucked in and engaged, but for the most part, I like, I've seen a lot of people mentioning the drama and I'm kind of like, eh, I just sort of try to insulate myself from it. And I don't think it hasn't been as big a deal to me because I've just tried to not like take it that serious. But it seems like lately there's been like kind of drama on EFT. I don't know how you handle it or how you view it. I think uh, I made the mistake of getting involved a little bit with it. You know, there's obviously some things I said, some stuff that I posted and I had to sit back and uh, think, you know, think about what I said and what, you know, what I was talking about. And I think a lot of it is just, you know, uh, for me personally, I, I kind of had to grow up. I was like, you know what, whatever's going on, I don't want to pick any sides. I just want to keep to myself from this point on and just post content and everything. So if uh, I guess I ever see anything like that going on, I'm just going to be like, yeah, I mean, it is what it is. I'm going to stay out of it. I'm going to I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be on this side of the fence chilling. So I'm going to definitely stay out of all that stuff anymore. I don't want to be a part of it man i mean i don't think it's like a bad thing to give your opinion if you believe in something that's right yeah. but i feel like people are like ah, they just it's like antagonistic you know what i mean it's like they get yeah. in there and they want to i don't know it just gets it gets a little bit toxic in some ways uh yeah but you know i mean and like there's some people that are anonymous and they, they get real toxic and then there's the people that are not anonymous and they're getting like i don't know it's just a weird dynamic like i've always said and i tweeted it the other day and i feel like this is a relatively hot take uh, and you and I can maybe connect on it. I'm kind of like, if you're anonymous and you're blowing a lot of hot air, it doesn't like, <laughs> it doesn't like hold as much to me. It, it doesn't like hold up as much to me as if you're somebody that's got your name attached to it. So I'm kind of always going to, 
in a weird way gravitate towards the person who's actually putting themselves out there, even if I don't agree with their position. I'm like, ah, I don't really agree with you, but you got a bunch of faceless people that are attacking you. I'm kind of like, ah, like, I don't know. The whole thing is like people, if you're anonymous, it's easy to make hot takes, right? Because yeah. you're not like attaching your name to it. And if you're attaching your name to it, it's harder to make hot takes because you got to live with it. And, uh, and everybody, and so I'll end it. I don't want to spend too much time on the drama segment. I just want to say that everybody should get along. It's, it should be a good community. Uh, my vote is to get more people to come out of the shadows and attach their name to what their Twitter is. I think people, I made that comment and people were like, I can't, I'm not able to, to do it. And I get it. People work for companies and they're worried about it, but it's like, really, it's like, I don't know, we're 2021. Like, just put your name, like, just don't say anything you don't want. I don't know. I just feel like people can yeah. do it. They don't want to. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, you're right. Definitely, you know, a lot of these anon accounts, um, they don't want to put their name behind it. You know, maybe they're, uh, some of them are afraid of, you know, they could say something or, you know, potentially put their job sure. in jeopardy sure. or anything, depending on how high they are and stuff. But I'm pretty sure there's some out there that, you know, maybe they're just scared and they don't want to know yeah. for, uh, for people to know who they are. So it is I, what it is. I get it. I get it. Well, the content you put out is good content. And I don't know hardly anything about, the wireline business and i want to talk to you about it like like i know that the last podcast you did i I watched the one you did you kind of got technical and you broke it down so i don't want to recover all that ground and make you like go through this like explanation of uh of everything but just for just for me personally and for some guests high level explain what you do uh and then before you get into that like let's just talk about your background like how did you get to where to what you're doing today like what was your journey like let's talk about the pathway and like the journey to get to where you are today okay so uh gra- i graduated at uh lee high school here in midland texas 2006 once i graduated i worked for the uh in midland independent school district which is misd um, i was 18 years old 2006 and i got my cdl there I was there for about three and a half years from their transition to uh construction for a small mom and pop company called Midwest Glass was there for two and a half years. So this whole entire time I had my CDL and the guy that actually trained me in uh, glass installation and everything, he, he took off and I knew he, he was, he's like, oh, I'm going to oil field. So this is like, you know, 2010 around there, 2011. So I continued working over there and I got kind of burnt out. Good job. But I don't know. It was just something I was like, man, I want to, I want to do something else. I want to make more money. Real so quick, real quick, call. real quick before I don't interrupt you. How old? I feel like we're like the same age. How old are you? Or when were you graduating? Yeah, dude, we're the same. When did you graduate from high school? <laughs> 2006. Okay, so you're one year younger than me. All right, all right. Yeah. Uh, just, I just, I could just tell from some of the music stuff you've posted, which is going to be some of my questions later. I feel like I was like yeah. this. I was like, you got to be like around my age, but uh, I'm 34. <laughs> sure, man. So anyway, sorry, didn't interrupt. So 2010, 2011. Go ahead. Yeah. So. Um, Called him one day. I was like, hey, man, I'm kind of burnt out, dude. You know, I want to change in careers. You know, I want to do something, you know, because it's like, man, I'm not getting any younger. I'm starting to get older, dude. So I need to really start thinking about, you know, my future for the most part, saving money or anything. During this time, I uh, I just got with uh, my wife. We were dating. So I was just trying to, I guess, be a a bigger person now to try to grow up. Got to do it. Got to do it, man. Yeah. (laughs) He's like, you ever heard of Wireline? I'm like, no, nah, I don't. I was like, what's that? He's like, oh, man, it's easy. All you're going to do is just drive a truck all day. I was like, well, shoot, man, I could do that. I, was like, <laughs> I, I, got, I got my CDL. I was like, I just, I haven't used it in about two, two and a half years. He's like, oh, man, go over. Uh, it's like, go over here. Go to this company called Wood Group, which doesn't exist anymore. And he told me the area to go. So there I am looking for uh, this company called Wood Group, which had recently got bought out and uh, became GE Wireline. So I was actually passing the shop the whole entire time trying to find it. Saw this other, saw two other companies. Both of them said Wireline. I was like, must be the same stuff. So yeah, try to, yeah. yeah, try to go into one of the buildings that was locked. Just, you know, it's like 5 p.m. You know, I wasn't trying to let my bosses know, trying to keep it on the DL. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. So then I walk into the other one, which I started my career at Superior Wireline. Walk in, the manager, he's like, hey, you know, what's going on? I told him who I am. He's like, well, do you have any experience? I'm like, no. I was like, but I'm willing to learn. He's like, we you have your CDL? I was like, yes, sir. He's like, oh, shoot, you got half the battle one already. So... He pulled me into the office, whatever, didn't even fill out an application. He started interviewing me, broke, you know, the number of a piece of paper and slid it to me and stuff. He's like, this is what you should be making. And when I when I saw it, my eyes got big. I was like, oh, crap, <laughs> dude. I never, I mean, I was 23. Yeah, like 23, almost about to be, you know, maybe 24 during that time. And I never made that kind of money before. So I was like, I'm going to make this salary guaranteed. Then I'm going to make a percentage off the ticket. So got hired on, 
I worked there. Um, I was a hand for about two and a half years. Uh, started training at uh, Pioneer Energy Services in the, the wireline division here in Denver. Yeah, yeah. Trained for about, let's say, six months, which uh, during that, it, we I was called a JFE, which is a, stands for Junior Field Engineer, which it's the, the pecking order. It's like junior operator, uh, senior operator, then like your lead. Then you have your JFE, then you have your engineers, and then you have your senior engineers, and then so on, manager, all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. So I was a JFE for about six months. They sent uh, they sent me to uh, Pioneer. Uh, they had their own little school, which is about a month. Um, they had to cut it short for me because during this time, it was like 2013, 2014. It was so dang busy. I mean, there was, well, I think the barrel was still around 90, if not 100. So I spent two weeks there, came back, and I ran a truck by myself for about a uh, a year and a half, almost two years. The crash happened in 2015, got laid off. I was probably out of work for maybe like two weeks, started uh, working again, but nobody will hire me as, a, as an engineer this time because I didn't know how to do horizontals, which is uh, wow. pumping the tool string down into the lateral. Uh, they were just coming onto the scene, like really like big time, like everyone right, was right, really right. starting to transition. Yeah, you know, everyone was really starting to get away from the whole vertical stuff. But I could... You know, I could do all the other services for the most part. I just needed someone to show me. Well, I was back as a as a hand for 10 months. And during that time, I was at Case Old Solutions, which no longer exists anymore. And they uh, they put me back on a truck then at, in 2016, and I've been back on a truck ever since. So Yeah, man. Going, uh, going hard for five years now. Second this uh, for the second go around. You enjoy it? Do you like it? Yeah, yeah. I uh, It's a super, super hardcore love-hate relationship. <laughs> uh, funny yeah. story. My first, uh, the very first job I ever went on, first first uh, vertical frack. Um, I remember the second day there, uh, where I was just chilling inside the perforator with the engineer and another operator, just talking small chit chat, waiting on the frack to be done. And all of a sudden, the hand goes, "Oh man, there's a fire!" I look out that window, it's just a big old blaze. I'm like, "Oh what? crap!" So, yeah, so I jump, I jump off, and what ended up happening was three pump trucks on the fracking side had caught on fire. I think it was like a hydraulic leak or something like that. Any, anyways, three, three of them caught on fire. So right next to us, we have explosives on the ground, and I, everyone just whoo, just books it, starts running. And I yeah, remember uh, <laughs> I, I stop, and my manager's like, "Keep going!" I'm like, oh shoot, man. So I was kind of thinking, man, what did I get myself into? Yeah. So <laughs> second job That's I went nuts. on, uh, there was a lot of issues, but I didn't know no better, man. I was a green hat. Yeah, yeah, I was just I was just there, kind of trying to soak everything in, which it was a lot. And I actually quit um, on my second job. I was like, "This is not for me, dude." I was like, I'm, "I was like, this is terrible." I was like, "This sucks so much." So the the manager actually came out to the field because that that crew was having a lot of issues. And like I said, I didn't know anything during that time. I was like a month in, man. So they were having misruns after misruns, which the misrun is is uh, when the gun doesn't perforate. Right. They go down. You go down hole. You get to your to the depth where you're gonna set your plug and shoot some holes into the formation. And you go and try to shoot it. Nothing. It's a misfire. And it could be a many different issues. You just have sure. to come out of the yeah, hole yeah, yeah. and then try to figure it out, which we call troubleshooting. Right. Well, this that job was like misrun after misrun after uh. misrun, and I was like, oh my gosh, dude, this sucks so much. And that's what yeah. I thought wireline was. So my boss, he was out there anyways to try to see what was going on. And I talked to him. I was like, dude, I was like, I'm just letting you know that um, I'm putting my two weeks. Like, I'm done, dude. He's like, this is this sucks. And he came and he, uh, he talked to me. And we had probably about a good 30-minute talk. And he talked me in staying. And here I am. Uh, September 1st will be 10 years. Wow. That's awesome. So, yeah, man, 10 years. Like, it's uh, – do you feel like you've now kind of – do you feel like you've mastered the craft? It's weird. Like, I feel like I'm about the – like I said, we're about the same amount of time. And, and – uh, is it still interesting to you? Is it still something that is, uh, you still feel challenged? Is it like you're, you're in your groove? Like just t- how do you feel like at this point? Like that's, a, you know, it's a solid chunk of your career uh, doing something. Yeah, yeah. there's, um, I, I, the nervousness is definitely nowhere near as much as it used to be. Like when I first like was fully broken out, full-fledged, man, dude, I used to be a nervous wreck, dude. Like I remember it, if it was a, a Sunday and I had to start a vertical frack the next day, I knew for a fact I wasn't going to sleep that night. Yeah. So I would literally just be in my bed, tossing and turning, just in my head, just like, you know, do I have this? Do I have that? You know, yeah. and then trying to put a game plan together. Okay, you know, we're going to get there. We're going to do this first, and we do that. We're going to do that. Like, nervous wreck, dude. And now it's to the point where, yeah, I do have that. I still for sure get the feeling of nervousness, but it's, I don't know, dude. It's weird. Like, somewhere between, like, 2016, 2017, it's like something just clicked like that in my head. 
and all those fears and all that anxiety that I used to get just kind of, for the most part, diminish. You know, you always try to stay on my toes, my toes for the most, you know, I try to be alert. But anything can happen any given second, you know. There's been times where I've been, you know, just killing it out there, you know, awesome spurts, you know, um, just going from well to well to well, no issues, no misfires, anything, and then just boom out of nowhere, you just have just one really, really bad day, which actually just happened to me on Father's Day. I had a really, really bad job, and yeah. it was just one of those times where I sit back and think, like, man, do I, I still want to be doing this, and be just like, just got to get back up, man, and right. keep on pushing forward. Yeah, it's... uh it's easy to like, I've worked in my, you know, I'm kind of like, uh, I've worked in the office my most of my career. I feel kind of like a poser in the oil and gas industry half the time because <laughs> I've just been like sitting in an office chair, you know, uh, trying to make, making things happen, but not out there necessarily uh, making it happen in terms of the physical, making it happen more just kind of behind the scenes at the corporate level. And when I see, so I think part of what resonates, I think with the content you've put out is seeing that element of being out there and and just seeing what you do and some of the things you've posted like i don't know it's weird like i can't explain it but it's like in your head you're not i don't know the best way to put it but like you don't envision it the way that it like i don't know man like we just live in different worlds and so i think that, and i think a lot of people on eft live in like a different world where you're like kind of in this like corporate world or like this like i'm not really in a like i would say corporate now i'm more in like i work for a lot of mid-sized and small size companies like with our company but but, you know, you live in this like office world, I guess is a better, better term. And you don't just get to see like what's out there. You hear about it. You look at, you you know, see emails or you talk about it on a phone call or you see it in like a PowerPoint or something like, hey, we got this frack and like we're going to run this many stages. And like you hear about like the, the way that the frack is going to be and it's like in a spreadsheet or something. Uh, but I think that's why for me it resonates and probably for a lot of people because you get to see like really what's going on and like for example uh what you put out with the uh when you're like writing people's twitter tags on the on the perf <laughs> guns uh i think that like that's that's got to be really cool for people i don't know i mean it seems cool to me it's just because i think that honestly before you started posting those i'm gonna be I, and again i'm gonna show my ignorance of the wireline business but like i don't know that i've ever seen a perf gun to be honest like i if that's is that the right terminology right that's what it's called yeah. Oh, yeah. You're, yeah, you're, yeah. That's fine. Okay. Oh. I'm making sure that I'm not sounding like too ignorant here, but I'd uh, I'd seen it on you know I I talked about it with people like different like we're gonna shoot this many stages and like whatever, but seeing it like and seeing like you actually loading it up and like doing all this stuff, I'm just like that's fascinating to me because I'm like I'm living in this totally different world, and a lot of people are, and uh, and you're kind of just right there hands on doing it, and like the stories that you mentioned around you know, this crazy things that happened. I mean, there's just like a safety element and like, it's, it's real. I mean, like, it's not a joke, like being out there, uh, at the well site, like a lot of things can happen. And I think that, uh, I guess where I'm going is it, I feel like a lot of people kind of glaze over a lot of what actually happens. It's easy to get caught up in talking about like how many ducks are out there, how many wells need to be completed, like what kind of completions are people yeah. doing? You know, people talk about all these things, like just like the finance world, right? Like, how much did it yeah. cost for that frack? Like how much did, like how much money did they make? Like how much, all this stuff, but like, you're not thinking about the perf gun and like what it looks like and like how they loaded it. And like the, the issues that you had, uh, when you were getting in and out of the hole and like whether something happened. Uh, so it's just, I think it's cool. I think that's why it resonates with people, but walk me through like what a perfect job would be. Like when you go out and like everything clicks and everything happens right. And then walk me through like what a bad day looks like. Uh, just cause like for me personally, I'm just interested in this stuff. Okay. So like a perfect day would be you show up to on your shift or whatever job you're going to do. We'll do it. We'll use the example where I've been on the horizontal, uh, fracks lately. So I'll show up to my shift. We'll get there, you know, there would be uh, no screen outs or anything frack. There'd be no shutdowns on maintenance on their side or anything else, whether it's like uh, water transfer to be able to uh, move the water to the pumps and everything needed to be able to pump down hole. Uh, one of the biggest things on our side is that we don't have any misruns. Uh, yeah. A misrun can cost, cost a lot of downtime because let's say, uh, say I pump down hole and I have a misrun where uh, the first thing I try to fire is always going to be your plug in a, in a, in a, during a frack. If the plug doesn't fire, okay, well, I was able to get down hole in, I don't know, maybe 20 or 30 minutes. 
Right. But that's because we're moving at, you know, the speeds we're moving at are fairly quick for the most part. But if we have a misrun and the plug doesn't shoot, doesn't, you know, doesn't set or anything, I can't pull out of the hole at the same speeds. I got to, you know, come out, shoot. Like, usually I'd be pumping down anywhere from like 500, 600 foot a minute. Now I can only come, bring the tool string back out of the hole. It could be as deep as, you know, t- the deepest I've ever been is just a little bit over 21,000, I think. Wow. Okay, let's say it's that depth right there. Okay, well, for some companies, they have um, procedures to follow if that happens okay. and um, to avoid any type of uh, like the plug presetting. Okay, now we have a plug that just preset a couple thousand feet up hole. So now we got to figure out how we're going to take care of that. But I just wasted a lot of time because now I got to pull a tool out, but I can only come out at speeds of like 100 foot a minute. So just do the math, you know, 100 foot right. a minute divided by, let's say, 20,000. That that's how long it's going to take. Not only that, okay, we're on surface. We got to lay now. We got to lay the tool string down and figure out where's the issue coming from. Is it coming from this gun? You know, is it coming from, you know, say somewhere in the line? Toward okay, you now we have a short in the line. Now we got to figure it out. But it's you know things like that. They cost a lot of um, a lot of downtime, man. And it, it, it's uh, it's real. Uh, it can get your spirits down on the whole cruise. Like oh well, crap. Now we just had a misrun. You know, um, we were running at a almost at a hundred percent efficiency rate. And now, boom, we just, uh, we just, we just, we couldn't fire a gun or if it happens again, I mean, there's, there's some people that get ran off or just, yeah. even, I think one misfire dude, yeah. nobody wants to get run off. That's, yeah. that's a, dude, that, that's a terrible feeling. Right. Well, it's weird. I'll tell you my experience with, you know, so when I worked back at Chesapeake back in the day, I was, uh, dealt a lot with production, uh, engineers and production superintendents. And so like a lot of what I dealt with was after the, you know, it was after the well was online is producing, but I did deal with field uh, personnel quite a bit, uh, and sometimes the superintendents, but also times guys that were the corporate guys, like production engineers, and then sometimes the guys out in the field. And I'll just tell you the culture that I felt, and maybe I'm off the mark here. You can tell me whether or not you think this is true, but that's like a culture of like blaming people. It felt like I felt like every time there was like something that happened that was wrong, whether it was like a, something happened with the well, it was always a lot of at least in my personal experience kind of pointing fingers around whose fault it was. And it was like, you talk to one guy and he's like, Hey, it was this service company. Like this happened. And there was like this musical chairs game of like, who's going to be the one that gets the chair pulled out. Right. And like, gets like blamed for something. So at least that's like the, the way I felt the field culture was, and maybe I'm mischaracterizing it. And maybe that was just my personal experience, but I felt like anytime there was something that was bad and I would try to talk to people and be like, Hey, like this is happening. Like, you know, corporates like asking like what's going on and it was always like a lot of pointing fingers so like is that and not to call anybody out or put anybody on the spot in terms of the culture but like that's how i felt it was out in the field it was always like kind of this finger pointing thing about like whose fault it was or like what the problem was i don't know do you see some of that like is it like that fear of like hey if something messes up like who's gonna get pinned or who's gonna get like blamed for this thing that that type of fear or just stuff like that definitely does exist i wouldn't say that it's for the whole entire, you know, uh, oil or gas industry, uh, you know, all together. Right. But there are definitely times, you know, like if, you know, let's say something happens and, uh, you know, there, there might be a, a, you know, a lot of finger pointing, you know, it was his fault. It was his fault out of fear of right, like, okay, right. I'm about to get fired. Or there's even, you know, the possibility of, you know, being replaced, not only just the employee being replaced, but the whole entire service company itself. Sure. I mean, you know, someone's, we're all knocking on the same door for the most part. Like you have, you know, especially here in the Permian, you know, there's so many different service companies out here. Everyone's going to be, you know, oh, I can offer it for this much or I can, you know, we can do it for this much versus that and everything. So I can, uh, I could, I could definitely see it, you know, m- you know, maybe in those sort of terms happening a little bit more, but. Well, it just always feels like, it felt like to me, there always had to be some blame put somewhere when the reality is yeah. I mean, stuff just happens, right? Like it's like, yeah. you're, I mean, you're dealing at 20,000 feet, uh, either below or either it's below or it's horizontal, but you're 20,000 feet out, uh, under the ground. And let's face it, you, like that's tough to control. Even the best, you know, wireline person that does what you do, there's going to be problems. Uh, so, I mean, that's a high pressure job. Like I, you know, I'm not going to put it in the same category as like a surgeon or something, but you're kind of in a category of like, it's technical <laughs> you're out there. I mean, I'm, you know, like that's obviously people's lives are at risk with that stuff, but like, I mean, there's safety stuff involved too with what you guys, with what the whole has happened out in the field. And so if there's safety involved, which I want to touch on a little bit, I want to hit too much on it. Cause 
uh, you know, safety, it's, it's important, but I don't want to dive too deep in it, but there's safety involved. There's money involved, time and money, and it's high pressure. And so I think that that is also part of what your content resonates with people is that like you're watching it and it's just, it's interesting and all those other things. It's high pressure. There's money involved. There's safety involved. Uh, and it's just a part of the business that a lot of people don't get to, get to interact with and see. But uh, moving off of that a little bit, like I want to talk about just like the truck that you drive around, like some of the stuff that you talked about with like how you service it stuff is really interesting to me, but also just like the booth that you're sitting in, like is, uh, and like when you're sitting there, like you posted this video where you're like playing music and it was awesome. You were like, no. you had like, you were like, you had like, it was like the lighting was all set and you're yeah, listening yeah. to, you're listening to tunes. And, uh, is that like in the truck? Like to explain to me like that booth or whatever you call it, what's it called? First of all, like I, again, sounding ignorant on the terminology here. So, the, the little room I'm in, that's yeah. the, uh, that's a, sh- we call it the shooter's cab. Yeah. And the reason we call it the shooter's cab, cause well, obviously it's a, it's a cab inside of a truck. But then uh, the whole term terminology behind shooters is uh, we shoot guns. Yeah. So yeah. that's what they that's like kind of like an old school term that they used back in the day. It's like, oh, right, you know, I, I remember I had one guy call me. He's like, uh, oh, man, are you a logger? Are you a shooter? And I was like, what? <laughs> it's like, I was like, I'm a hand, dude. And when they say that, because you have like some wireline guys where that's all they want to do is they just want to log, you know, whether it's they're running bond logs, gamma ray logs, neutron logs. Yeah, and then you have yeah. other guys where all they want to do is just, they just want to make, they want to make that fast cash. They love going to the frack. So they're, they're shooting the perf guns, right. they're perforating. So they would just call them shooters. So yeah, that's, that's the shooter's cap. Learn something little video new right from, there. What's up? So learn something new right there. Yeah. Um, uh, so it's a, it's a part of our wireline truck. It's a, there's many different, uh, names for it. Um, uh, the per- perforator, the logger, uh, the E-line truck, just, you know, for the most part, we just you do it so long. You just tell the guys, Hey man, go get the truck. He's like, are you pick up or the logger? I'm like, I'll just get the logger. You know? Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of just, you know, secondhand nature. So in that little video, the one where you're talking about, um, I'm a, I just barely perforated, set the plug, uh, shot our, shot our guns. Now we're pulling out of the hole so they can start fracking. So I'm pulling out of the hole right there. And I have a computer next to me on the computer has a system which for the most part is, uni- is a pretty universal for all wireline companies called yeah. a warrior. So on that system, I, it's uh, able to, the data that's being, you know, recorded or being sent back up whole to my computer and everything. Uh, it's giving me uh, what they call a CCL kicks, which there's a tool on top of my, my gun string, which is a casing call locator. And that's used for depth control. letting me know where I'm at in the well bore. So while I'm, you know, coming out of the hole, it's just, I'm seeing it seeing uh my depth of exactly where i'm at so i'm coming you know w- once you're coming back out of hole you're gonna your numbers are gonna start going back you know negative from twenty thousand feet then it's go right back to whatever your uh your bump up is which is pretty much you know when i'm at surface so there's also on the on that uh the graph and everything you have uh my tension which is telling me how much is being pulled on my rope socket because you have a, a breaking point that you don't want to pull over it's like man if i pull too much on this rope socket i could potentially uh pull out a you know pull out to where I leave the guns down hole. So you got to make sure that you're not pulling out too fast yeah. and you're not pulling too much weight and everything. So that's, um, you know, right in, right in front of me, I have my joysticks where I can control the measuring head, which the measuring head is the measuring unit where the wire line goes through. Just a little, I really don't mess with that. As long as you have the truck, you know, aligned with the well the way it's supposed to be, right. you shouldn't have to touch it. You shouldn't have to touch it at all. The main thing that I'm, contr- I'm using is uh, my in and out. It's a little joystick, you know, push forward, your feet in line into the hole, you know, come back, you're, pulling line out, you're bringing the tools out and uh, you can control all that by raising the RPMs up. You know, obviously the higher the RPMs up you raise, the faster you can come out of hole and everything. So there's, there's a lot of little, di- like little things and gadgets on there, man. Uh, I remember when I first used to see that stuff, I was like, man, that's there ain't no way in he- uh, hell I can ever do this. Like this looks so freaking complicated. Like some of the things that I do now, I remember like, you know, like I said, thinking back, I'm like, dude, like there's no way I could ever do this, but I guess, uh, I don't know. I just, it just came, I just learned with time, man. That's looks, all it is. It's just learning. It looks sweet. At least the video you posted, I was like, this looks awesome. You're like sitting in Oh, yeah. The thing. And the, 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 the music, obviously, I have a radio in there, so I just connected Bluetooth, so I'm just jamming. It's like, you know, I'm, I'm going to take my GoPro out. I'm just going to send this little video on Twitter real quick, man. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I want to talk about the music stuff because I really enjoy it. It's not, the, so the reason why, to get back to like, you know, I made a lofty claim. I said, yeah, I would put you on the Mount Rushmore of the Twitter. And I made it, made it for a lot of reasons. I enjoy the, uh, enjoy the content. I enjoy just like the other stuff too. Like you post a lot of good, 
uh you know other content as well like the music stuff i really think is cool you post like some pictures and stuff and sometimes i know who it is i'm like this is cool other times i'm like i don't i don't have to it's kind of a guessing game i'm like you know i was like he's into something that like he's into some cool thing that i don't know what it is so i try to figure it out but uh but before we move into that stuff uh, real quick on like your company if you want like give a plug like why are you guys the best at what you do uh if people like are looking for somebody to do what you do why should they use you guys uh, and if you want, you can talk a little bit about the company in general, but just uh, give you a second to just kind of pump yourself because uh, I'm bought in. I mean, from what I've seen, and I don't know much about Wireline, so maybe that doesn't say much, but uh, but you, this, what you've posted has been like a good sales tool. And if anything, if your boss or anybody is watching this, I'm going to tell them right now that you are doing some incredible uh, guerrilla marketing right now. And it's working because I'm like, if I ever had to do wireline stuff, I was like, I'm calling this guy and I'm getting him out there, whether it's in the Permian or whatever. So talk about the company for just my, a second uh, if you want. I'll, th- I'll throw this in real quick. Uh, my boss actually has a Twitter. Uh, so he uh, he sees the stuff I put. He's a, I guess you'd call him a little lurker or whatever yeah, you yeah. want to say. Most are but, lurkers. Uh, I, yeah. I t- I'll tell you what, so what draws me to underdog and what's, you know, for the most part's kept me here. And I, I really, I, I don't plan on leaving. You know, I've been doing this so long already. And there's guys that have been doing it way longer than me just in wireline. But I'm at the point to where I don't want, you know, I want to make this my home. You know, obviously I've been doing this so long. I want to continue to do it, I, you know, and I'm, I'm going to ride it until so we're done, you know? Yeah, yeah. But uh, the thing that I love the most about Underdog is that it's a, we're a small company. You know, we're not some big, you know, no disrespect to any company out there. You know, we're all in this right. for the same thing, you know, to make money at the end of the day to provide better lives for whether right. it's, you know, yourself or your family. But I feel like there's just so much more security there. It's, it's, it's such a more personal level because essentially it's just, it's a mom and pop company. Like we're literally owned by a husband and wife. Yeah. And we've all like on underdog started in, I believe 2012, just as a rentals company, they had light towers, shower trailers, cool down trailers. And uh, then they got into lay down machines, which they use for tubing on the uh, workover rigs and everything. The wireline division started in 2018, and I remember right when it started, my boss was trying to get me to go on, but I was really super adamant at first because, you know, I was already established somewhere else. But then, you know, later on down the line, probably about six or eight months uh, when they were operating, I took the jump. Yeah. So they they were able to uh, take care of me. You know, he 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 he's kept his word on everything he's he's uh, told me. You know, he's there's never been a time where I've had to second guess or anything like that. But like one of the things that that I love the most is that they took care of us during the COVID crash, which, you know, obviously COVID is still happening. But, you know, when I say in terms of COVID crash, whenever, you know, oil tanked down to, I, I forget the exact number. I know it was in the negative 30s. I below $4.20, right? That's, yeah, definitely below <laughs> $4.20. That's for sure. Pound gate. Well, you know, I knew I had a lot of, I had a lot of buddies that I've met along the way. It's where, you know, unfortunately they lost their jobs, which a majority of them are starting to, you know, they're not working since, thank God, oil has been increasing. Yeah. But they, they kept us on and, uh, you know, we uh, we really didn't get no pay cuts or anything. It wasn't really up until like recently that we did get a pay cut, which, you know, our money has been returned to us now since, you know, the market's starting to recover and everything. So they kept us on during that time. And I was able to see this company go from one truck to now we're now we have six uh, wireline units. So even though I don't, you know, have no any type of financial backing towards it or anything like that i still feel like you know it's my company you know and for the you know for the most part we've been you know every company has their hiccups and all that but we've been able to do you know some really you know awesome jobs for you know major players out there we uh we did a really high profile job right when COVID hit to where they were um actually fracking within city limits like they were literally fracking across the street from a from a canes an H-E-B and a Chick-fil-A, wow. and it was just right, yeah, right there, you know, right as soon as you get into Midland. Midland, That was baby. a really high, yeah, that was a really <laughs> high profile job. So we're able to do jobs like that. You know, we've established ourselves. We're getting, you know, getting more and more customers and we're, we're just getting busier and busier. So, okay, now we got to start hiring personnel. So we're growing as a company and everything. That's awesome. So we're extremely, you know, we're, we're price competitive, you know, it's, we're there to work with whatever we have to do to make sure that, you know, that we can you know make the customer happy and everything you know but there's also you know sometimes you know you get what you pay for the good thing about us is you know hey not only are we able to uh, you know give good pricing but you know we're going to walk the walk and or was it we're going to talk talk and walk the walk it's pretty much what right. i'm trying to say on that standpoint we're um we're we're 
I know. I really don't know what else to say about it. So well, I'll tell you I, this. I I'll tell you this much to your boss or whoever it is, the owner of the company. You guys are crushing it. You're the best Twitter wireline company that there <laughs> is, uh, and it's not even close. I mean, like I don't even I don't know any other wireline company. I'd never even seen any wireline stuff until I started watching the stuff you posted on Twitter. So if there was an award, I don't know what that you know what the <laughs> what the prize is for it. I think the prize is that you're crushing in the marketing game. I don't know how much that they do marketing wise, but you're getting them for, you know how much money? I mean, I don't know. I'm Again, I'm trying to pump you up for your boss here, but you know how much money it would cost to get 4 million uh, impressions paying a marketing, some, you know, high profile marketing company to get out there and put the wireline, your guys' company out there on things. I, it's a lot of money. It would be a lot of money. It would be, it's a six, that's six figures. Yeah. Six figures easily worth of marketing uh to get that many impressions uh and maybe maybe that's an exaggeration I actually don't know that for a fact but I, I would guess that it would be like <laughs> six figures again i'm trying to pump you up that's a lot of good marketing so uh i think you guys are doing a good job from what i've seen from what you're telling me it sounds cool it's a small company and uh, and i can relate to that like i own a small company and it's tight-knit deal and uh at a minimum you guys are crushing it in the wireline uh, digital marketing space. I think you're probably number one. Yeah, it's a. Uh, I have a little goal, and I tell my boss all the time, like, dude, uh, my goal out of this, just like I guess a little goal I'm setting for myself is to bring a customer because of EF Tweet because of the stuff I posted. You will. And there's, I, I think I, I think I've gotten a little bit close, but I, you know, it's just location is everything. You know, right. unfortunately, you know, some of these guys aren't here in the Permian; they're located right. in other places. Yeah, yeah, it'll happen. It'll the good things will happen. You know, put out quality. Here's my take on content, and uh, and I'm new to it, but my take is that you put out quality, and this is not just content. I think it's just like anything in life. Like put out quality things into the world, uh, and you get quality things back. Like, am I right? Yes, sir. You just put out quality things, uh, and so we'll we're getting like I don't know. We can talk as long as we want, but we're coming up on an hour. I mean, mindful of your time. I know you got uh, some kids which I admire. I have three kids of myself and I think you've got four kids. Is that right? I think I've seen you post about that. Yeah, I got four kids. Uh, my oldest is 14 and then I have a 12 year old, which she'll be turning 13 here pretty dang soon. A nine year old and a six year old. So I got my hands full and uh, my, my little 14 year old, little track star. Unfortunately, we uh, kind of had a rough summer. Um, he ran into a little bit of uh, injuries, uh -oh. so he's just kind of healing up. So we had to cut the uh, the what we were hoping to do for everything for the summer. Uh, we had to cut it all short just to make sure that we're going to be good to go for the for the next school year. Well, that hopefully will heal up. But I'm going to tell you, like yeah. I respect that too. I think that uh, you know, I mean, again, it's kind of maybe I'm reflecting on my own some of these things. I'm like, you're not anonymous on Twitter. I'm not anonymous on Twitter. Maybe I'm like connecting with this uh, because some of the things I'm self projecting on you, but. I have three kids, which isn't four. And I'm going to tell you, it's not easy. Having th and my, mine are younger and maybe it'll get a little easier. I think my, I've got a six-year-old, a, a two-year-old is about to turn three next week and then a one-year-old. And so uh, it's, man, it's a, it's a lot of work and it is, but I love the proud daddy stuff that you've put out there. I was, I say proud daddy. I'm like, I tell people, I'm like, I'm going to go <laughs> proud daddy on you real quick and I'll show them some picture, like tell them about something that my kid did. Uh, so there's some respect there too, but, uh, and so I don't want to get too much into personal stuff. So that's another thing that I like that gravitates me towards your, uh, again, why I'm like, I vibe with the content. And then the other thing is, uh, the music stuff. So I don't know if you've seen like in the studio here, I guess this is a studio, it's my garage, but, uh, <laughs> in this like podcast thing that I've put together, I've got some instruments. I don't play as much as I used to back when I was younger, I used to play in a band and, thought I was a rock star when I was like 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, whatever. Uh, and it's, it's always something that I loved and music's always been a passion for me. I still try to play a little bit. I'm, uh, it's weird. Like I would have been more nervous to do this kind of stuff than play music in front of a camera back in the day. And now since I don't play that much anymore, I'd probably be more nervous to play music than to do this stuff. But but I love it. I love uh, listening to albums. That's something that I am passionate about that I think has kind of been lost on the new generation. I'm always somebody that's like, I got to listen to the whole album. And I really like an artist if I can like listen from track one to the end of the album. And I, you know, that's something I've always, that's, I've always been that way. And so when I've seen some of the stuff you've posted, I think at least in my mind, I feel like you're the same way, but tell me about your, you know, obvious passion for music. You got the Marshall head and the records in the background, but let's talk a little bit about oh, yeah. that. 
Man, uh, ever since I could remember, dude, I just uh, there's like certain songs that I remember I used to stay up for uh, whenever MTV actually uh, played music videos just to yeah. listen to that song. And then and then I remember like whenever, uh, hopefully I don't get in trouble for this, uh, whenever like <laughs> LimeWire and Napster and everything hit the scene. <laughs> Shoot, dude, I had a yeah. My music library was just like in the man. I'm, I'm incriminating myself. Uh, was yeah, like thousands and everything. That dial up. Did you hit download and then like go to bed and wake up in the morning and be like, see if their songs were downloaded? I'm telling oh, you, we're like the man, same. Uh, we're the same age, so it's like I feel like we're like we lived in the same dial up internet. Like that noise. Like my parents would be uh, like, don't AOL. get on. They'd be like, don't get on the phone line or whatever. And so I'd wait till it was like almost time for them to go to bed. I'd like put a pillow on the back of the computer because be like. Meh, like making that noise and I'd like try to like cover the sound and then I would load up LimeWire or whatever Napster and uh download a bunch of music and then half of it would work and half of it wouldn't but that was like a whole generational thing that kids nowadays they just wouldn't get yeah and I think what uh what kind of like uh boosted it like my love for music so much more was um I grew up skateboarding I started skating when I was like 12 or 13 and yeah. then I stopped when I was about 22 and I wasn't the best but I was pretty good so we'd watch all these, you know, skate videos and yeah. every single, every single buddy or every single pro had like their own little three minute part right. or whatever. And there'd be certain songs on there. I'd be like, man, what, you know, who's that? Who's this? Who's this? And I remember there's one of my favorite skate videos to this day. So it's, it's an old school one. It was uh, by a company called Girl. It's called Yeah Right. And it just had all these sick ass dudes on there, man. And I remember I heard this one song by this dude named Mark Johnson. And yeah. it was like, man, I was like, who the, I was like, who the hell is that dude? It's like, gosh, damn, that, that sounds good. So I'm like 15, 16, and I would always we'd watch that video just so I could hear that song again. I said, like, dude, they sound like the cure or something. <laughs> and then I remember I found a website, it's called skateboardingmusic.com. I don't even know if it exists anymore. And they give you a track list for each video, like, you know, this is, you know, so and so for this right. or whatever. And I, fi- I went back to find that one band. I found them. I saw the name. I was like, I was like is that a chick's name? I was like, who the hell are they? So I started just downloading more and more on their stuff. And that band was um, Joy Division yeah start listening to them so they led me to another band that led to another band and another band that i started going to different genres and everything but what uh i think the probably the uh the two genres i enjoy the most so it's going to be uh post-punk which it's basically just your uh an explosion of music that happened uh after the whole punk scene in the united kingdom so you're looking at like shoot or as early as 76 till about maybe mid 80s just right crap load of all these bands just coming out i just started listening as many as i could some of them i was like man i, I love these guys to death some of them they were just really bad <laughs> the other genre would happen to be uh, uh texas rap and that's that's one thing that caught my attention whenever you would like some of my stuff like on the texas rap i was like man, this yeah, you know about dude. screw and everything yeah oh man i, I love that stuff I, actually it's uh I, I grew up uh like i think the first time i remember hearing that stuff was probably like sixth seventh grade my cousins and them were showing me i was like this stuff sucks dude turn this off but then when I got to about ninth grade, especially uh, from when I was 18 to like 21, I, mean, I had this big old bookcase of CDs, like it could hold like 300. And there was all just like old school Texas rap from like DJ Screw, the original right. Swisher House and all that. And I would just play that over and over and over and over yeah. for years. And I stopped listening to it for a long time. And then like I'll, so I'll throw a couple back or whatever. And I'll start putting it on. It just gives me so many good memories, dude. I'm yeah. just like, man, I remember – remember what i was doing whenever i first heard this song or just the the i don't know it's weird man i feel like when you listen to certain bands it just brings out like this emotion and you're just like it, it's, it could just make or break your day or just set the tone or it makes you think about yeah. you know what you're doing at that time of your life and uh man i'm, I'm i love music i think anybody loves music but i like i love music and yeah. i think you you can understand where yeah. i'm coming from hundred percent. It's crazy that you mentioned that thing tied to memory. Like, I, I don't want to get like serious on it, but like I had my grandpa had like Alzheimer and I remember when he got like really bad, like at the end, like they could still like, he would, he could still like sing and like remember music from when he was like a kid. Like he could, you could play like a song and like he would remember it and be able to sing it. And so that thing you're talking about, how it's like tied to memory. Like, I think that's like, that's a real thing. And I don't know, I've yeah. read some stuff about it, but like, I think there's a part of your brain that if you're somebody at least that gravitates towards that, I know it's in me. I know people in my family have it. And there's like people in my uh, family that are artistic in some ways that I'm not. Like I've got cousins and people, you know, aunts and uncles and stuff that can paint and that can draw and like do all these things. And some of them are really musically talented. Like I definitely got the music side and like that's like the only thing for me that I have that's even remotely artistic. Like I can't draw. I can't. 
I don't know. I just, anything like I can't see visual stuff in my head, but I can see music in my head. And so I resonate with that a lot. And then the other thing you said that I, that I love is just like the skateboarding stuff. Like, I don't know. It just gotta, it's gotta be like that we're the same age relative. I think we're like one year apart, but we're kind of in that same time period. And I just, I was the same way. Like I, you know, BM, I rode BMX, like I, I rollerbladed, which then I found out that wasn't cool. I did that when I was like young, like, you know, <laughs> elementary school had like soaps or whatever. And I was like trying to like grind with like, uh, with like shoes on or whatever. <laughs> and then yeah, uh, I've never soaked. Yeah. And then I moved from that to like BMX for a minute. And then, uh, probably like BMX, like when I was like sixth, seventh, eighth grade, maybe, or six, sixth grade, seventh grade. And then I graduated up to skateboarding, which was like the hardest in my opinion. I think that's not a hot take. I think skateboarding is definitely the hardest. Uh, it's not attached to your feet, like, like rollerblades. That's, that's wussy stuff. And then, uh, and bikes like, you know, it's not as hard either. And then did skateboarding for a minute was into like, uh, one of the, I used to watch the skateboarding videos with the, the music on it. Like I remember, and I don't know if this is like, uh, one of the best ones or not. It's just like back then, like you only had like VHS tapes. So, or DV, maybe yeah. DVDs, but primarily VHS. And I remember we had like Rodney Mullen versus Day Wong song and like that. And then it was like one and two and my buddy had it. And we would like watch like Rodney Mullen, like doing all these tricks where he would like flip the board and like stand on it and like do all this stuff. And there was that song in that one. It was like real dramatic. It had like the, it was like classical music. It was like a piano. I don't know. You know what I'm talking about? Maybe you never saw it. If you yeah. Said, you I've, said, I've, I've seen two and three. I can't remember if I've seen one. Uh, spending, yeah. Sometimes I'll go back on like, we'll be, uh, me and the kids will be chilling in the living room. I'll be like, hey, let me show you something, dude. And uh, yeah, I told I them, I was like, this Google. was the very first, yeah, this is the very first skate video I ever saw. And it was, uh, we watched it on a VHS uh, audio, One Step Beyond. And I remember like, there was a Bam Bongera song on there from oh, a yeah. band called Him. Yeah. And I, I, mean, I, would, I would listen to that song all the time, you know, having to download off a dial up and then just turn around and listen. And I was like, man, dude. Just what was, watch those videos what was that time. one with uh on Jackass or maybe it was Jackass or maybe it was Bam where it was like dun 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 you know what I'm talking about that CK, yeah CKY CKY that one yeah, yeah. that was like yeah. uh that was like one of the original maybe that was like pre Jackass was that pre Jackass that was like what Bam and them did that and anyways that whole genre like that whole time period like right there whenever that was I guess that was like early 2000s late 90s like early 2000s yeah was kind of like my coming, I guess that sounds weird, but coming of age, like when you turn like, you know, your preteens or whatever. And like, so we were kind of in that same period, which I think that like a lot of the stuff that we're talking about, that was right at the same time. So maybe that's the connection. But when I see some of the stuff that you're posting, it just resonates with me. I'm like, this is like, this is, I don't know. It's <laughs> good stuff, man. I enjoy it. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes I'll just uh, post random things that I'm just like, oh, this I don't know. Just thinking about the past. I, mean, I think I think about the past a little bit too much sometimes. It's good. So it's it's cool. It's like a blog, things. right? Like, it, or I say a blog, but it's like some kind of micro blog. Like you, I think it's cool. Uh, maybe you'll uh, go back. Twitter needs to make it easier. And I'm not saying it needs to be like Facebook easy, where it's like throwing stuff in your face. Facebook's weird. I, you know, but I think it would be nice if it was a little easier to like reminisce on some of the stuff you post because you put that stuff out there and you create the timeline. And uh, like you said. Maybe you get into the past a little bit, but uh, but at least you're kind of, it's almost like a way, in the modern times, no one's writing a journal. Like, let's face it. Yeah. No, no one's writing a journal. Oh, but, I've, uh, I've tried. Yeah, I've tried too. Happen. It doesn't happen, right? You just tweet, yeah. you tweet, and you get it out there into the world. Uh, well, I'm glad we got to do this. I mean, we're hitting up an hour. I'm going to be respectful of your time. I know you've got uh, kids, and maybe they're asleep. I don't know, but... Uh, but let's not, you know, I'm glad we got to do this. I, you reached out or we talked or whatever. And, uh, and I was like, let's do the pod. And I was glad it happened because, uh, you're for all these reasons that I mentioned on here, it's not just the wireline stuff and the seeing out in the field stuff, but I also just felt like at some other level, I just, it connected. And so I'm glad we got to do this and maybe, uh, hopefully it won't be the last time we do stuff at a minimum. We're going to be tweeting and uh, doing social media stuff together, and then the next time in Midland, I'm gonna make. Next time I'm in Midland, I'm gonna make it happen. Uh, we'll get together there too. How about that? For sure, man. Yeah, that sounds awesome, dude. I always anyone that's down to come to Midland, dude. I'm always uh, willing to hang out with whoever, man. I don't have a lot of excuses. I went there recently. Actually, went to Midland the first time ever this year. It was the only place I traveled during. We were like working on something for work, and I I felt guilty that I had never been there. I was just like, I think I tweeted it out, and I was like, confession time. I was like been in the business for 10 years never been to midland 
Uh, Dude, I've never uh, never been to Oklahoma, man. And there's a, there's actually uh, quite a bit of uh, EFT cats from Oklahoma that are really, you know, they're pretty badass, you know. Uh, BRV's one, uh, sleds. I mean, yeah. Sorry if I left anybody out, but I mean, every, all the all the Oklahoma EFT cats are pretty bad. ADBB, he got kicked off, but yes. he reached he reached out. Uh, he's a good dude. We we grabbed a beer yeah. the other day, and uh, and I know Sleds. Apparently, he knows me, and we're like, he's like was real cryptic, and he was like, he's like, I've known you longer than EFT, and I was like, I was like, hit me up in the <laughs> DMs, bro. I was like, tell me who you are, and then he didn't. So I need to just like hit him up in the DMs and be like, what's up, man? Like, let's get together. So I know there's more here. And I think I've met BRV or I've talked to BRV before on some unrelated business thing a long time ago. I think I know who it is. Uh, but there are some good people on EFT in Oklahoma. And I guess maybe that's where we'll leave it for anybody that's listened this long. Uh, you know, get on Twitter, get part of the EFT or the Energy Twitter community. Uh, you've got some great content. We'll post your your tag in the in the description and uh and we'll keep it going but i appreciate you making the time and, and coming on it's been fun for sure man thank you for letting me come on it's always a pleasure whenever you guys uh, hit me up to be able to do these kind of things yeah absolutely all right thanks <laughs>